Halloween. This is a time that I hate with a passion. Because for seven and a half years, as a high priest in Satanism, that was one of the days that was looked forward to. In Wicca, in the occult, in Satanism, every one of those, it's Samhain or Halloween, is the day, the night that is celebrated the most. It is also a day when human sacrifice is celebrated. Now, kids look at it as a time of going from door to door trick-or-treating. And it's a time, again, of getting. Because the whole premise of Halloween is to go from door to door, knock on the door, say trick-or-treat, and you get candy in your bag. Hopefully. Okay? I always wonder what would happen if you walked up and went, Trick or treat, and they went, Oh, trick, <laughs> <laughs> and shut the door on you. Then you probably, get toilet paper. probably. But Halloween is a time when kids look the most to being something other than themselves. And it's also a time to dress up like ghouls and goblins, witches, your favorite superheroes. Um, some kids even dress up like Bible characters. Uh, and we, we put the jack-o'-lanterns out, the pumpkins out. We go get them out of the pumpkin patch. You know, we go on the hay rack rides where we can get the pumpkins and, and go carve faces into them. And it's a night of fear. And see, we celebrate fear because people like to be afraid. But is there another agenda behind Halloween? Is it all fun and games or... Is it something else? Because, see, there's a darker side to Halloween. Not just the dressing up in the costumes. Not just the going door to door and asking for candy. Or stealing other kids' candy. There's a hidden agenda behind it. There's a dark secret behind it. And what we have to do is we have to look behind the eyes of this celebration. And we have to see what it's really all about. And again, if we can say that these things glorify Jesus, that these things bring edification to the body of Christ, that it's okay to celebrate. But the trick-or-treat to Halloween is not worth the price to pay. You see, when Lucifer was cast out of heaven because of his pride, because of his black heart, because he wanted to sit on the throne of God, he first thought, why shouldn't I be a God? And then he said, why shouldn't I be God? And the Bible says that he took with him one-third of the stars. Now, that's the angels. We don't know how many angels there were in heaven, so we don't know how many that is. But we do know that these beings became fallen. They were fallen from grace. And they're not allowed back into heaven. Satan has no, uh, uh, he has access to the throne of God. Even to today, he goes before God and accuses us. That's why he's called Satan, the accuser of the brethren. He has access to the throne of God where he can go in and accuse us, but he doesn't have access to go back in and take over his angelic authority again. 
You see, after Ezekiel, when, when Lucifer fell, nowhere else in Scripture is he ever referred to as an angelic uh, cherub, as a special or anointed cherub as he was in Ezekiel. And so Lucifer, coming down to heaven, or coming down from heaven, coming down to the earth, said, I've got to find a way to get back at the Creator. Well, now creation can't destroy its Creator. But, he said, what I will do is I will destroy the creation, us. And so that's why you have things like addictions. Uh, uh, that's why you have suicides, young deaths. Because this is a way that the fallen angels get the creation to be destroyed by destroying themselves. And he said, I will come down and I will find a way to make people worship me without knowing it. Because I can't just come out in the open and say, here I am, I'm the devil, worship me. But if he can disguise himself as other things and get that worship for himself, then he's achieved his plans. And he did it through a celebration called Halloween. It all goes back to the Celtic religion. It all goes back to Wales, uh, Scotland, Ireland, over in the, those regions. And the Celts were a peculiar people. They were a very peculiar people because they worshipped many different gods and goddesses. And so we have to look at the origin by going back to the Celtic religion and their beliefs. And some of the beliefs were they believed in the power of magic. And they worshipped many different gods. And they believed in the spirits of the dead returning. And they were a fierce people who lived in fear of the reigning priests of that time called the Druids. Now you have to understand something. These people are so afraid of the Druids because that's the religious priests. They are so afraid of them that they will give their lives if the Druids tell them to. That's how they, much they fear them. They are very ritualistic. They practice witchcraft. They practice seeing, looking into the future, spells, and they look to omens to tell them their future. And these priests were also known as the mighty men of oak because they carried oak staffs and they believed that these staffs contained magical powers that they could call on at will. And they practiced human sacrifice as homage to their gods in return for favors that year. That's the Yule. Remember we talked about Christmas time and how the Yule was whether or not the gods that, that, that had been, or the uh, sacrifices that had been made on Samhain had been accepted or not. And these sacrifices were made on their most celebrated day called Samhain. And Samhain is a night when spirits of the dead rose from their graves and walked the land. And they were so afraid of these things, walking around. And you know, when you, when you come back as a, as a dead person, you're kind of decayed and everything, so you don't look like you just went to the salon, you know. You, you come back, you're, you're, you're weird looking, you're, you're scary looking. And so in order to, to trick them, what they decided to do was to dress like them. Now, if spirits come back, not only are they, they were your friends in the flesh, they'll still be your friends in the spirit. If they were your enemies in the flesh, they're still going to come back and try to get revenge. So they're also your enemies in the spirit. And to protect themselves from all these vengeful spirits, what they would do would be to don costumes and try to look like them in order to trick them by making them blend in. And that's where we get the custom of the Halloween costume. The Celts would dress up in order to trick these spirits into thinking that, oh, I'm one of you, don't harm me. And that's the, that's the premise of the Halloween costume. And they would dress up in grotesque costumes. I mean, they would try to look like these beings, like these demonic spirits. Now, the origin of trick-or-treat. Kids, I want you to listen to me very carefully. As I told you before, I don't sugarcoat anything. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Here's where trick-or-treat comes from. These priests, these Druid priests on Samhain, on the night of Samhain, would go across the countryside and they would demand a sacrifice be made. And they would ask for the youngest child of the household or of that manner to be placed in chains on a post outside the house. 
And they would pass over the land that night. And if the sacrifice was young enough and innocent enough and acceptable, then they would carve grotesque face in a turnip, not a pumpkin. Not a pumpkin. Because, see, over in Ireland, the, the turnips are still the most widely used vegetable. Not the pumpkin. It didn't go to a pumpkin until it came to the United States. They would carve a grotesque face in this turnip and set it on the porch of that house. And that was to symbolize to these spirits that were roaming around that night that the sacrifice had been made. And if the sacrifice wasn't given, if, if the father of the house stood up against these druid priests and said, I'm, I'm not giving you my youngest, I'm not giving you my daughter, I'm not giving you my son, then they would draw a pentagram in goat's blood, the five-pointed star. They would draw it on the, the porch uh, front door of that home. And someone in that home would die that night. Now, I'm not saying that, that demons went in and killed them. I'm not saying that the, the druids snuck back in and killed them. But remember, these people are so afraid of these people that most of them died out of fear. Literally died out of fear. And this is where trick-or-treat comes from. It has nothing to do with door-to-door -door seeking candy. It has nothing to do with walking up to someone and say, trick-or-treat. It has to do with child sacrifice. You know, this is, a, this is a time when kids need to learn. Children need to learn how to evangelize these things. My daughter, who's eight, eight years old, can go to a school and she can tell any classmate in that, in that school why Halloween shouldn't be celebrated. She's no. She knows it. She's very sensitive in the spirit. She's also heard Daddy talk about it and she remembered everything. And she will evangelize. I've heard her talk to other kids about it. But peer pressure is a tough thing, and it's hard. It's hard to tell your child, well, you know, I don't want you dressing up like them. I don't want you wearing what they're wearing. I don't want you going out that night. Because, see, the, the kids will make fun of them for not doing it. Okay? So, as children, they need to learn how to evangelize the truth. Because, see, people don't want to hear the truth. In, all my, in the time that I started my, my, uh, my ministering and, and God put me on the path to minister and, and expose these things, I found that the one truth was that people don't want to hear the truth. It's, they'd rather not know because then they're not accountable. You see, once you've heard the truth, now you're accountable for that truth and what you do with it. Now, what you're seeing here, these are modern-day druids. And they're standing at a place called Stonehenge in England. Now, they still do not know what Stonehenge is, what, what the purpose of the true purpose of it is. Uh, they think that it has something to do with uh, astronomy, uh, the stars and the planets, and also seasons and times. And they say it's a huge clock, but nobody really knows. However, they do know that sacrifices were made on those grounds by the Druids. And these are modern day Druids. And I'm sure the, the authorities don't look too good on uh, them doing any sacrifices. But here they are assembled and you see they're in a circle. And what they do, these are the, the priests here holding those, those twigs. See that? Remember when we talked about the mistletoe being given out to the, to the people, believing that it was a, a powerful um, tool to, to do away with evil spirits? And what they do is they, they assemble there on Halloween night and they believe that energies come down from the universe, travel into those stones and are reflected and in the center of that is a huge energy that they can tap. Whoa, wait a minute. Didn't we see that on that UN flag? The exact same thing with the people associated in a symbol, uh, in, a, in a circle, assembled and then inside of that was the energy source. Hmm. And every year from September through November 1st, this tradition of the offering of sacrifices still continues. And this is why you have child abductions and school shootings. Now I want to read to you something that came across to me today. And this is from Fox News. And it's, it says, hunt underway in Chicago for a creepy clown who stalks children. And it says, parents on Chicago's south side are on the edge after reports of a man dressed as a clown 
has tried to lure several children into his van. The creepy clown, who has been spotted four times in the past week on the city's west and south uh, sides, wears a wig and full face paint and carries balloons when he approaches children. And area schools are on the alert, and some have even sent letters home to parents telling them to warn their children about talking to strangers. Here is an Ohio man. Burning cross was just a Halloween decoration. In Canton, Ohio, a Canton man accused of burning a cross in front of his home says he was arrested in a misunderstanding over his Halloween decorations. And it says that he wanted to make his annual yard display more authentic and set fire to the T-shaped wooden stand that holds up his scarecrow so it would look more weathered. <laughs> now, these people are so apt at abducting a child that all it takes, parents, is for you to turn your head just one time. You can be in a mall, you can be on your front porch and, and leave your child on the front porch, go in to answer the phone or go in to get something, come back out, and your son or daughter is gone. They usually use black vans, they paint the windows so you can't see in, and they will roll up, and I mean, there's three to four people in these vans, and they can, they can abduct a child before you know what's happened. And it makes my blood cringe whenever I see uh, an amber alert on the TV during this time. It's, it's because I know that, remember, Mabon is the gathering of sacrifices. It's the time when sacrifices are gathered for Sam Hain. And that's why you have school shootings during this time, more than any other time. Is this a time of sacrifice? The, the kids at Columbine watched a video game called Doom, day in and day out where you are attacked by zombie creatures. And if they bite you, you begin to get this infection and you become one of them. And so you go around and you start shooting these creatures. In the next video that I'm planning to do, I'm going to show a, a, a screen of a, of a video game called Kindergarten Killer, where you are a disgruntled uh, bus driver at a, at a school and you begin to take a gun and you go from room to room shooting school children. Video game. It's still a time of sacrifice. What is the hidden agenda of Halloween? This is it. To fascinate, lure, and captivate our children to desire to be something other than themselves. That's the agenda. And you see, it works because you have people like Harry Potter and some of those things that, that lure kids to want to become witches, want to become wizards. Uh, uh, you want to have a, a special demon, little demon with you, a shape-shifting demon with you as in uh, the golden compass. It gives them a chance to be something they're not. They can be something totally different. And I'll tell you what, I've seen kids dress up, and as soon as that costume goes on, they're right in character. It's almost like their personality changes. In the last three to four years, I watched an interest and obsession with magic and all forms of occult be on the rise. And what stunned me was that it, it, the largest group had once been school children, but now was being outnumbered by adults. And I thought it was kind of ironic because when I was on the uh, tour on the Under the Spell of Harry Potter, uh, when I was on that tour, God managed to put me on a plane and never failed. There would be one adult or two adults on that plane reading Harry Potter books. And, you know, I mean, it was a, it was a great time to minister, but it just, it just stunned me because, you know, it, it dawned on me that it's not the kids because the kids don't have the money to go out and buy these almost $50 books. It's the, it's the parents. It's the adults that go out and get it for them. And the more they begin to read it to their children, the more they get into the story, now they've got to find the next book so that they can find out what happened. And now they get wrapped up in it. And even Christians find themselves amazed and fascinated by the occult. Even Christians. 
It's all part of the strategy. After all, we've been told by our, our prominent church leaders, I remember when Chuck Colson came out, and he said, we've got to embrace all religions, and he's not the only one that said that. And we've got to realize that witchcraft and Satanism are a religion, and they're a protected religion. That means if they want to open up a satanic uh, church right next door to you, legally there's nothing you can do about it, because they're protected. On the outside, these practices appear to be fun, and they're, they're somewhat innocent, but the Lord doesn't see it that way. And he speaks of, of, of those things that, he's, that he hates and he detests in Deuteronomy 18. And even the media has, has grasped onto this. Now, I, I, I wonder if some of you have seen some of these. Uh, these are programs that are on television now. Uh, one of them is called Ghost Hunters. And these are plumbers by day and ghost hunters by night. And what they do, it's, it's on the Sci-Fi channel, and what they do is they, they go into places that are reported to be haunted and people see uh, apparitions in the house or they see things moving around or they've had uh, attacks go on. And so what these guys do is they go in and they, they do what's called uh, electronic voice uh, projection and, and you can't hear the, the spirit speak to you. In other words, a ghost can't speak to you where you can audibly hear him, but he can talk on a, on a tape recorder. And so what they do is they take this special tape recorder and they put it on a table in, in that house and supposedly the spirit speaks to them on this tape recorder. So when they play it back, they hear the voice of the, the spirit speaking. Uh, another one is paranormal state. And these are college students that have formed a paranormal uh, uh, investigation team. And what they do, they don't just go out looking for ghosts. They go out looking for demons. Uh, there was one uh, episode where there was an eight-year-old boy, and he was being attacked. I mean, literally attacked, being thrown against a wall, being scratched, uh, being literally attacked physically by something in the house. And so they went into this house and they, they played the Ouija board, and they contacted the spirit, and the spirit attacked the boy, and you saw him fall off of a chair, and he, he grabbed his stomach, and they opened up his, his shirt, and there were four scratches across his stomach. Now, ghosts don't do that. That's not the spirit of Uncle Bob or Aunt Lucy, okay? That's a demonic spirit. That's a demonic attack. Uh, there's most haunted, haunted places, haunted America. Oh yeah, there's even Montel featuring a woman called Sylvia Brown. And Sylvia, good old Sylvia, she's a psychic, you know. What she does is she talks to these people and she sees, she sees dead people, okay? And they're all over the place. They're all around you. And she talks to them and they talk to her. And so, you know, you can find out where Uncle Bob kept the inheritance or hid, you know, your, your money, you know, type of thing. And, and so she tells them, well, this is, just, uh, this, is, this is just Uncle Bill, and he's mad because you moved the piano from uh, the, the family room to the playroom. And if you'll move the piano back, he says that he'll stop all this, this attacks and everything will be okay. And so they do it. And so the, then all of a sudden the spirit stuff stops, and now they're happy. And they're, they're, you know what they've done? They've just given that spirit license to be there. Instead of going in and casting it out, they told it it's welcome. And it will stay there. And the elements of this satanic ceremony called Halloween is fear. See, people like to be afraid. It's the thrill of the rush. That's why you get on a, a, a big roller coaster. and You're going down that roller coaster and you do the most stupid thing, I think. is You stand up or you throw your hands up in the air while you're getting ready to go down. You know, it's the thrill of the rush. It's that rush of fear, that adrenaline rush that we all search for. That's why your teenagers go to those slasher movies where they're killing teenagers by the droves and they're slicing them up and they're mutilating them. And it's, it's the kind of thing that if you can sit there with your girlfriend and, and not get scared, and not, you know, not uh, cringe or jump, you know, but she's over there just literally going off, then you're the man. Okay? So it's an element of fear because, see, fear will grip you faster than any other, other emotion. And it will capture you. Some of the, uh, some of the, the aspects of Halloween uh, are ghosts, ghouls, witches, devils, haunted houses, monsters, and what the police call hell night. And any, any police officer or sheriff's officer, deputy, will tell you what hell night's all about. So let's look at some of these things. Let's first look at ghosts and ghouls. 
Because what they say is that ghosts are the disembodied apparitions and they are your, your dead aunt or uncle or father or mother's spirit that is now coming back and visiting you or visiting someone in the house. Or it's a spirit that uh, uh, doesn't want to go into the, the afterlife and so now they're trapped in this house and they, they just want to stay there. That's what a ghost is. What really is a ghost? Well, here's a question. If a ghost is an apparition, what they call ectoplasm, and you can't touch it, okay, you can't literally physically reach out and touch it, because you, you've seen, you know, when they have the apparition, somebody will try to touch something and, and there's nothing there, it's just air. If you can't touch it, how can they touch you? And you know that there's a scripture in the Bible in 1 Samuel that says that the dead know nothing. So if the dead know nothing, why are you trying to talk to them? Why are you trying to reach out and touch them anyway? You're forbidden to. Uh, another scripture in Hebrews 9.27 says, And it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this they keep coming back. Or they just roam around the earth. Or their spirit is trapped here. No. But after this, the judgment. There is no roaming around. There is no second chance. Ghosts are what we call familiar spirits. They are demonic spirits that have been around you 24-7 or around the person that you're trying to contact through a Ouija board or going through a seance 24-7. And they know everything about you and about anyone else. And they will communicate back and forth to each other. And that's how they know so much. And that's how they can answer all your questions. And now you think it's that person that you're really trying to contact because nobody else would know what that spirit was telling you unless it was really them. Well, trick or treat. Ghouls. These are beings that are half dead, half alive. We call them zombies. Okay? Or people that just had a bad day at the doctor's office. And, and these things are grotesque and they, they, they feed on human flesh. And again, these are the kind of movies that our, our young people go to. They, they get that thrill of watching these things. Seeing other, other people being slaughtered, mutilated. Witchcraft. We look at uh, witchcraft and sometimes parents tell their kids, Oh honey, that's just something on TV. That's just something out of the Wizard of Oz. You don't really have to worry about that. Uh, or there's a, a good witch and a bad witch. You always notice that in the stories there's a good witch, but then there's a bad witch. Well, the Bible says the only good witch is a dead witch. So, <laughs> you know, you have to start, start giving your children the answers that they deserve to have, which is the truth. And witches actually cast spells, and they are primarily, traditionally, and exclusively of the female gender. Very rarely is a male ever allowed into a coven. And these witches will meet and they will do what is necessary to promote themselves. Whether it's uh, going out and, and a casting a spell on another girl or going out and casting a spell on an ex-boyfriend that dropped you, those sort of things. Young women by the hundreds flock into bookstores around the world and they're seeking to tap into that secret magical power that will bring them their heart's desire at their command. And there was a book out uh, years ago called Teen Witch, written by a witch named Raven Wolf. And in, in Teen Witch, it appeal, appealed to teenage girls to want to get into witchcraft, want to study witchcraft. Because see, it could tell you how to get your, if a woman had a, a, a boyfriend, that you wanted, it told how to put a spell on him to make him leave her and go to you. It also told you uh, how to get the, the A's on the, on the school test, how to rule the, uh, the, the mind of the teachers so that they would give you good grades, so that they would pass you even though you were failing. Uh, all kinds of things like that. And that see, that appeals to teenagers because they want things and they want it now. They don't want to wait. And so Teen Witch was one of the best-selling books on the market at that time. Make no mistake about it, witches are very real. They practiced and they used for what's called forbidden magic or occult. 
and they use potions and they use charms and they use spell casting. Devils, devils are fallen angels. They're now no longer angelic status. When they fell from heaven, they lost their angelic authority. They're still able to operate in the spiritual realm, but they can also operate in the physical realm. And they're referred to as devils. Nothing more than fallen angels. Haunted houses. You know, we glorify these things. Uh, sometimes a city puts on a, a haunted house. Um, uh, some good organizations, well-meaning organizations, uh, will sponsor what's called a haunted house. And these things bring big bucks in, millions, throughout the, throughout the year, throughout this, this time of the year. Because people want to get scared. They want to be afraid. And so what they will do will be to go into these houses and there'll be actors or, or uh, people that have been uh, uh, given instructions on how to become a monster and they will dress up like uh, these characters and, and these ghouls and these goblins and these devils and these witches and they will go into these houses and when you're walking through a room, they'll jump out at you or they'll, they'll pop up and they'll try to grab onto you. And it's all, it's all the element of fear because not only will you go through the house, you'll also turn around and you'll go back through it again because once you've seen it now, now you know what to expect, so now you go through it. And what makes a house haunted? Well, it's first of all, it's, they say it's inhabited by spirits of the dead. In other words, somebody doesn't want to leave the place. In some cases, violent demonic attacks occur. Well, what brings them? What makes a house haunted? Well, several things. An evil deed, a murder, abuse, any kind of abuse. It doesn't have to be physical abuse. It can be verbal abuse. That's why, uh, brothers and sisters, as Christians, we've got to be careful the words we speak in our homes because we can bring forth curses or blessings. Torture, and because they've been summoned to be there. In other words, somebody opened up a book and called forth a demonic spirit. Just, you know, experimenting. Or they played a Ouija board and they contacted the spirit. Or they played uh, uh, ter with tarot cards or they played with crystal balls. Those things will attract demons like a magnet. All those things will. This is a house on South 93rd Street. And it got its notoriety by, uh, this, was, this was years ago, got its notoriety with a uh, Shawnee County Sheriff's deputy who went out there because there were kids out there. It was an abandoned house. And they were going out there and because kids were going in, they were having beer parties out there. And they went into the house and the deputy went up into the master bedroom. And he said that on the bedroom floor, on the, the, the upstairs floor, was painted a circle. And inside that circle was a five-pointed intersecting star. And inside that star was a, in the center of the star was a dead squirrel. And it was stinking. And so he said, I, I walked in, I, I walked into the circle and I picked the squirrel up and I took it out and threw it away. And after that, he had wrecked, uh, I, I'm thinking it's like three to four police cars, uh, sheriff's cars. He wrecked them. He fell off of a, a ladder. The ladder uh, scaffolding just gave way and he fell off, broken arm. His, his wife went through a, a bunch of ailments and some of his kids did also. And he attributes what happened to him because he walked into that circle and got that squirrel out. Then it got notoriety because kids now thought it was kind of cool to go out there. And so they did and they started walking in there and they would hear voices speak to them with no one there. Uh, some kids reported going into rooms and their names would appear uh, like something was carving their name on the wall or on a door. And then there were people who went out and took pictures of the house and not on the regular photo itself, but on the negative, uh, you could see flames coming out the window of the house. And the house got kind of torn down, run down. Uh, it was kind of fallen down. And uh, the, the good brother that brought me to the Lord um, he called me and he said, let's go out there. And I said, okay. And so we did. And we walked in the back and outside in the backyard, it was, it was interesting because 
covering the whole backyard were these huge stones, and they formed a huge circle in the backyard. And we went inside the house, and we, we found the pentagram, and, and, I, and I saw that it was a satanic pentagram, the five-pointed star turned upside down. And around that star were written the Enochian keys, which only uh, Satanists would know what those symbols meant. And then we went downstairs and we found the fireplace and the fireplace had been uh, uh, chipped out so that it would form an altar so that it would be the, uh, big enough for a person to be laid on. And we went downstairs and we found bones. We didn't ask what kind of bones. Um, since then, that house uh, had a fence put around it because too many people were going out there. Uh, it was private property. The, the people who owned the, the land were complaining they put up a fence, and then uh, they the, finally the, they tore the house down. And uh, as I understand it from, from my good brother, Reg, uh, they've built a beautiful home out there now. But guess what? The land was never cleared. What was there before is there now. And it's only a matter of time before evil rears its ugly head and stuff starts happening in that home because they never... They never repented and never cleared the land. This is Anton Zandor LeVay, the head of the Church of Satan. Look what it says. We think too different. There are those who actually worship Satan and will make a pact, a blood pact with him for fame and fortune or whatever their heart's desire is for a certain amount of time on the earth and then Satan calls on that contract. We have the wannabes, and you have the elite. The wannabes are the kids that uh, that dress up in the face paint, like the white paint, uh, put the black lipstick on, the black around their eyes, paint their fingernails black, and they're fascinated with death. They're called goths. And the elite are your doctors, your lawyers, your professionals that are high up, even government officials that are high up there that are in the position they're in because they've they've signed a blood pact. Hell Knight, ask yourself this, why do all the idiots come out on, on Halloween? Literally, I mean, laced candy. When we started hearing about laced candy, people putting uh, a PCP in candy, injecting it into, the, into candy. Now, who would do that to a child? It's, 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 it's like if your mind is not all there, or you have some kind of mental disability, you can be affected by these things more than anybody else. There's vandalism. Police will tell you that there's more vandalism on that night than any other night. I don't know how many mailboxes we've had destroyed by kids going down the, the, the street on that night, and they'll take baseball bats and hit the mailboxes and break them off. Um, I got smart. I put a big metal post in there so that if they hit with a baseball bat, they're going to... <laughs> but... It's, it's, it's a night of vandalism. It's arson uh, where they set fires to buildings, and there's also deaths. Remember years ago, uh, there was uh, on the college campuses, people were building huge bonfires and, and, uh, in, in celebration or building in effigy, and they, they were making these things as high as they would go, and then people were falling off of scaffolds or off of uh, platforms and falling into the fire and, and dying. Hell night. People participate in strange games and customs of this pagan religion. Some of the things that they participate in is bonfires. These were bonfires built to light the way for the spirits. And they were also used in druid sacrifices of humans. Uh, what they would do would be to put the, the sacrifice in a wicker basket and they would hang it over a, a huge bonfire. And the way that the sacrifice burned is w told them whether or not they were going to have a good year. The guy in the basket wasn't having a good time, but it told the Druids whether or not they were going to have a good year. Snap Apple, uh, this is a game, we call it Bobbing for Apples, and it was a means of divination, and it was played by boys, young boys, and apples were set afloat in a tub of water, and if you could uh, take your hands behind your back and you could reach down into that water and pull up an apple, that you were assured of the love of your desire. And that's where the, the Bobbing for Apples comes from. Divinations, they have runes, casting stones, and scrying, and that's like taking a mirror and painting it black. And if you stand there and look long enough into the mirror, you're supposed to be able to see things 
Well, I'm sure if you looked into a black mirror long enough, you start seeing anything, you know. But. And it was divining of the future, and they would ask it questions concerning uh, marriage, luck, health, and one times of, uh, when one's time of death was going to be. Those were popular uh, questions then. Owls, bats, cats, and toads are things you see all over in Halloween. They're, they're, they're creatures that are familiar with Halloween, and they're considered to be what's called witches' familiars, and it's believed that Satan would take the form of one of these animals and aid the witch in divining the future. Jack-o'-lanterns, these are the pumpkins. Remember, we, we talked about it started out as turnips, and then when it was Americanized, it was pulled over to pumpkins. And they started carving grotesque faces in pumpkins. Also called lantern man, hobblangers, or will o' wisp. And there were ghostly lights that bobbed along like a lantern in someone's hand or, uh, called corpse candles over in England. And uh, they, were, they would appear in, in bogs and things, and people would see these lights and think that they were spirits. And the Celts would carve grotesque faces in turnips to fool evil spirits. Today, not much has changed. We're still doing exactly the same practices. Sam Hain, the Lord of the Dead, the Night of the Dead, is glorified and promoted in the movie industry. There was a movie out uh, in 2007 called Halloween, a remake by Rob Zombie. And it was a remake of a, a series of movies called Halloween. And it featured a maniacal killer called Michael Myers. And Michael Myers killed his sister with a big butcher knife. And then all of a sudden, something possessed him. And he was put into an institution. And he grew up in an institution, an asylum. And he was worked with with a doctor. And the doctor said that when he looked into the eyes of Michael, all he saw was pure evil. That he knew that evil existed because it was living in Michael Myers. And now Michael Myers escapes from the, the asylum. And he goes about and he dons a... <laughs> Believe it or not, he dons a, a made-up uh, William Shatner mask. You know, the captain, yeah, from, from Star Trek. And uh, they, he dons one of those masks, but it's made painted white and made to look totally different. And he, he dons this mask, and he dons a pair of overalls, and now he goes about killing teenagers. And when you watch the movies, it's nothing more than a, a time of mutilation and murder. I mean, and, it, and it's graphic, very graphic. And you see the, that, that rush, that adrenaline rush, is what draws teenagers to watch these movies. And the, the weird thing about him is you can't kill him. You can blow him up, you can cut him up, you know, but you can't kill him. He, he keeps coming back. There's Halloween 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, and, and, you just can't, you can't get rid of him. can't get rid of Michael Myers. The enemy is real. Then we have to learn the hidden things about him. We have to learn how to discern what is evil and what is not. Now, listen to me. We cannot become Christian witch hunters. There is not a demon under every rock or a devil around every corner. But when something is out and out open and they're blatant about it, then it is our responsibility to expose that darkness. But we can't be Christian witch hunters and go looking for the devil and everything. Because see, the trouble is, if you look for the devil and everything, you're going to find him and everything. The enemy is real. It's not something made up. It's not something out of the Wizard of Oz. It's not something in a book. He's real. He exists. And his plot and his plan and his whole agenda is to get rid of God's creation. There are those who worship the devil in the dark side, and they're very dangerous. The Gothic we talked about, the Gothic movement came about several years ago, and it gave people an opportunity to celebrate death, people that were fascinated with the macabre. Halloween gives people the opportunity to become a part of this strange, weird, and horror-filled world of darkness. Even adults look forward to the night that they can dress up in costume and become somebody or something else. Remember, the whole agenda is to fascinate and lure and captivate into being something other than yourself. And as a child, we're taught that it's fun to scare others. Oh, it was great. I mean, I used to look forward to Halloween so bad as a teenager. Because, see, I, I'd lay down by the, by the porch on our house, and I'd lay there and wait for kids to come up to the porch 
and I had the light kind of dim on the, on the porch. I put in like one of those 10 watt bulbs or whatever, you know, so that they couldn't really see really good. And I had a glove filled with Kleenex and it was hanging out of the mailbox. And I had a, a you know, I had on the, on the middle finger, I had a, a string going up and I could move that string and make that hand wave, you know, like this. And, and it was so much fun, you know, I mean, the, the kids would come up to the door and they'd ring the doorbell, ding dong, and I'd go, oh, and you'd leave, leave these little kids and look at each other and go, what was that? And I said, I, had, I don't know, like that, ring it again, ding dong, and I go, what do you want, you know, like that, and you can just see the fear, they start trembling, you know, and I'd be like, hee, 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 you know, and, and I'd start working that hand, you know, look at that hand, look at that hand, <laughs> you know, going up and down. And, and, and they were just scared, you know, and it was, oh, it was fun. You know, and they'd, they'd drop their candy and run off and we'd pick it up, you know, it was great. <laughs> but it gives, it gives us a time to, to really scare other people. And it's fun to scare other people, see? What they're actually doing is they're opening themselves up to secret things that are biblically forbidden and should remain <laughs> sealed. Should never have been opened. But most parents don't see any harm with allowing their kids to dress up and copy these things. They even see it as innocent fun. Blessed Sam Hain, what you're seeing here is a witch in her cauldron. See the Ouija board, the Wiccan star. They celebrate this night. This is one of their holidays. If Satan had a holiday, this would be it. Why would any child who professes to love Jesus want to dress and look like something that God says he hates? He calls it an abomination. Deuteronomy 18 says that God finds these practices to be an abomination. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Abomination is something that God detests with his whole heart. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That's child sacrifice. Do we still have that? Absolutely. One way we have it is abortion. Or that useth divination. These are tools used for foretelling and seeing into the future. Crystal balls, tarot cards. Or an observer of times. This is stargazing, astrology, divination, uh, supposed influence of the stars and how they work on your, your uh, life. You know, what sign are you? Or an enchanter. One who hypnotizes and controls through his voice or by music. A lot of bands out there know how to hypnotize kids with the music. Or a witch, one who practices the ancient craft and uses magic spells, potions, and hexes to promote herself. Or a charmer, one that uses objects like jewelry, etc. to cast spells over others and control their minds. Or the Bible says a consulter with familiar spirits, one who has spirit guides, giving them counsel and advice on their affairs and undertakings. Or a wizard like Harry Potter, skilled in the magical arts, one who's able to summon and cast spells. Or a necromancer, one who attempts to summon the dead in order to get information. Remember we said the dead know nothing? Seances, Ouija boards, mirrors, grave calling. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. These are instructions for blessings, but it's also a warning goes with it. And that is, we've got to be careful whose door we're knocking on. Because if you're knocking on the door of Satan, 99 to 100% chance, he's going to be home. And he'll answer. He's ready to answer that door. He's ready to answer on a beck and call. In the book of Proverbs, we find the, the lifelong fruits of training a child <clears throat> in the way he or she should go. We're able to make this training so strong and deep that our children grow older, they won't depart from it. Train up a child, Proverbs 22, 8 says, in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If that same child is trained in the ways of the world and Satan, chances are they won't depart from that either. Former Beatles member George Harrison understood this. He uh, was a Hindu, uh, and he worshipped a Hindu god called Krishna. And in a Rolling Stones interview, he said this, The main thing is to get the kids, nail you when you're young, and brainwash you. Then, you've got, then they've got you for the rest of your life. And that's true. 
The lure of the occult is strong. Strong. We cannot get caught up in it. We've got to be very careful that we don't get so fascinated that we're drawn in before we know what happened. The church has got to stop condoning and accepting these beliefs and practices and use the authority it's been given to fight against these things. I've said it before. The church is the only institution on the face of the earth that has the authority to go against the very gates of hell itself. But we're not doing it. We've lost our spiritual muscle. We've lost that authority. We've got to get it back. We've got to realize we're in a war. We're in a mission field, but we're also on a battlefield each and every day of our lives. We've got to put on God's holy armor. We've got to put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and take up the sword of the Spirit. And you say, well, what about the shoes? Well, see, that's up to you. Because once you know the truth, it's your responsibility to take it out. Not keep it in the church, not keep it in the Sunday school class, not keep it to yourself, but take it out. Because there's too many out there that are perishing. We've got to take it forth. We've got to take what we know and take it forth. While, while it's still time. Those who love and love the, serve the Lord Jesus Christ have no business flirting with the kingdom of darkness. None at all. The fight's on. When thou goest to do battle, look what, what God says. When thou goest to do battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and people, more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. That's to let you know that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. The lines have been drawn, the war has been declared, and it's on. We've got to be like lions. We can't be like meat kittens anymore. We've got to start roaring the truth. We've got to start making people listen. Jesus is watching over the world to see if we will follow his instructions. Look what he says. Therefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. And if we do all these things, and if we keep in account what God says and his word and not stray from some other belief system or let some other system come in and corrupt us. If we can do those things, we can have victory over the darkness.